Hi, James. Uh, welcome to the PPTA podcast. I just wanted to, yes, this is the, this is the, uh, the podcast guest. So James Stacy Taylor is a full professor with the College of New Jersey. He's a moral philosopher. He's been active in this space for many, many years now. Um, we have been, been talking about some of the more um, controversial or edgier aspects of um, the considerations and perceptions of plasma collection. And um, you are very, very well published. You've got a number of books, hundreds of, of articles, op-eds, and so on. But we're here to talk more specifically today about this one, uh, Bloody Bioethics, and um, your, your most recent work on some of your thinking with regard to, to plasma collection. So I guess the first question is, um, why this book? What, what's in it? What needs to be said that hadn't been said before? What makes it different? So I think what makes it different is it's a pretty radical departure from the usual discussions of pain for organs or body parts. So normally the discussion of pain for organs or body parts has got a pretty well-trodden path. So people in favor of donor compensation would say something like, you're going to get more plasma, you're going to get more blood, you'll get even perhaps more kidneys if you compensate donors. And then the opponents say, no, this isn't, either isn't true, or you're going to have reduced quality of blood, plasma, or kidneys, or it's going to be unethical in some way. And then the proponents of donor compensation come back and say, here are the reasons why your criticisms are wrong. So that's the usual approach taken, and that's the approach taken for at least 20 or 30 years. And as I was working through the arguments, I realized something really interesting, that the approach should actually be on the other, way, the other way around, but the proponents of donor compensation should go on the offensive, because it actually turns out when you look carefully at coercion, exploitation, and social cohesion, what really happens in the space of donor compensation is that when you don't have compensation for donors, then it's that they get exploited, coerced, and ill-treated. So it isn't the case that proponents of donor compensation should be on the defensive. All the defensive work should be being done by people who want to ban donor compensation and basically interfere with people's lives. Where you are today with, with your thinking as it's evolved over the past several years. Yeah, I, I think it's very much a sort of halfway finished research project. So this part is all done. And I'd like to explore ways in which donor compensation is even better for patients and for donors than regimes where it's banned than we now think. Because there's a lot of exciting ideas that were generated in me in this book, and they're all rather half-baked, but I like to push forward with them. Right, right. Well, I mean, that's, that's one of the things about doing work of this nature is it's kind of iterative. Um, it builds on itself as you as you continue to, to work on the ideas and... Um, sensitize it, expose it to, to peers and to the outside world to get feedback. And Yeah, absolutely. And to be perfectly honest, Josh, when I first started attending PPTA meetings, I was thinking they're going to be kind of boring because obviously donors should be compensated. There's nothing really interesting here. We all know this. It's not like something like kidneys where you can have real questions about are there going to be exploitation? Is there going to be coercion? What's going to happen to donors? Plasma is pretty clear, cut and dry case, I thought ethically. And that's when I started to realize it's not merely the criticisms are easy to respond to. It's the arguments all go the other way. It's regimes which ban donor compensation, which are the problematic ones. In your book, you, you have uh, some discussion in there on um, donor health, donor safety, donor safeguards, things like that. Um, and there, there are a lot of, I, I guess you, you went over a lot of the studies, but uh, I guess the question is, you know, what about whataboutism like that? And that's where we get, you know, sort of these hypothesis generating meetings where um, you know, you, you have an, an almost an infinite uh, um, selection possibility of what question you can ask. Um, and so the, the work for making sure that donors are, are safeguarded is, is, is never truly settled. It's never truly done, and the industry is quite, 
quite, um, in my uh, in my view, quite assiduous in in the way that it follows it. But I was wondering if if you had any thoughts on that as you were writing that chapter and and some of the things that you've heard just by being in this space and your understanding of it. Yeah, what I found really striking in writing that chapter was the absence of any real empirical support that donors are harmed by donating plasma. So I was working on one of the obvious objections, which is if you allow donors to donate fairly frequently, as the United States does, this might be detrimental to their health. Well, that's an empirical claim, and so we would expect there to be empirical studies supporting it. And I could find none. And that struck me really forcefully because, as you know, this is a, in some cases, hotly contested claim whether or not you should compensate donors. It's hotly contested whether or not the United States should allow a frequency of donor compensation, but it does. Although, as you know, as, and as an aside, almost no donors sort of fulfill their full potential of right. donating as much as they're allowed. So that's right. something of a red herring in the debate. And I could find no evidence at all, even from the most vehement opponents of donor compensation, that donor health was in any way compromised under the current system. And that, I thought, was really striking. Yeah. What, in your view, would perhaps um, give greater assurance for um, donor safety and donor health? That's a good question. Um, I suppose there could be two routes to take. The first would be at the level of policy, and the second would be at the level of addressing potential donors. So at the level of policy, I would like to see more longitudinal studies of donor health and has this has donation affected donors positively, negatively? Not at all. And my suspicion is probably either not at all or maybe even slightly positively. Donors might avoid risky behaviors because they want to continue donating. That's speculation on my part. Right. But I can see that happening at the margins. So I would like to see long-term studies done, funded perhaps by the industry, but even better, or funded by completely third parties, so there's no question of bias. Right. And I would also like to see more donor engagement, as it were, say, this is my experience of donating. It was a positive experience. It was done in a clean, pleasant center. People were nice to me. I'm making friends. There's a real community. And obviously, I'm helping to save lives. So right. I would like to see a lot more donor stories coming out into the media, because that's something which almost I never see positive stories from donors. I see stories which where donor and it's often centers are located in these areas of town, like near colleges or in borders. And then there's an implication that somehow something suspicious is going on. But we never right. actually given any real information and it's all innuendo. So back to the book, you have some some pretty incisive and trenchant critiques of Richard Titmus and and his work, upon which a lot of the the ongoing debate is is based. So um, can you summarize some of your your findings on that? Sure. There's say two main lines of concern that I had with Titmus. The first is his book's old, right? It's written early 1970s. And that's a totally different medical and regulatory environment than the industry is in now. And it just boggles my mind that people still draw on Titmus as a way to make public policy in 2023. That's like saying, going to a Ford dealership and saying, we can't possibly buy a Ford Focus, which is a really safe car. And somebody asks why, and you say, well, the Pinto used to explode. It's like people would think that's just nuts. Nobody would think that's a reasonable way of going about things. So even if Titmus's concerns were appropriate in 1970 concerning hepatitis A, hepatitis C, they're not appropriate now. We've got testing. The industry has run completely differently. It's a completely different regulatory environment. There's many more safeguards than there were in the 1970s. So Titmus is, to put it bluntly, just irrelevant at the medical issue. Mm. And the second concern that I have was with some with the sort of aura of criticism of donors, which I find really weird, but Titmus has. 
And he's got all this discussion about, and he, this is his terms, skid row bums donating and all these really nasty views of donors. And some of them are racially tinged, but it was as mm. well. It's not a pleasant book. It's hard going. And then you start, I'm really boring. So I started to think, well, was this the case that donors were stigmatized in the 1970s? So I started to look through his references and I discovered something really interesting, but none of his references support his claims. Mm. He's, and the only one which comes close in claiming that donors are stigmatized was a short piece in basically a medical magazine, not an academic journal. And it's a humor page and it's expressly a humor page. And it says, you know, the Bowery Boys, which are sort of where he gets the idea of Skid Row bums. Now the Bowery Boys can sell their plasma in San Francisco. Isn't this great for them? And it's like a sort of, this is a funny little joke. Here's another right. way in which people can make money. And the idea of that you're actually almost 60 years later making public policy on the basis of an offhand humor comment in a magazine is just nuts. Clearly, nobody's actually bothered to go back and read Titmus's sources. And also, here's another thing which really I thought was crazy, and I actually had to check multiple times to make sure I got this right. Titmus claims that people who sell plasma, or blood in his case, in, in 1970 were making the equivalent of around $45,000 a year. And that's just untrue. Yeah. It's just not right. And I calculated it something like several hundred dollars for each donation. It's like, that's just wrong. Yeah. So clearly nobody's bothered to check his sources. And if they have, then they've just sort of swept the inconvenient truths under the rug. So, right. you know, the idea, so it's just out of date and it was wrong at the time. So it's just yeah. crazy that Titmus is such a giant. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, in your book, you you, you uh, predicate a lot of your argument on what is basically a cornerstone of, of bioethics, which is which is informed consent. Arguably, a lot of bioethical thought started with with the idea of kind of moving away from from the the um, patriarchal model of of you know doctor and patient into something where somebody would have greater agency. Um, in terms of of their experience, and you know, informed consent obviously has changed a lot, and it includes a lot more things than what it did in the 1940s. Um, from whenever it was originated, from you know, get, getting away from from tort law, and and things like um, you know, uh, uh, World War II, and and such. So you know, you see it with all types of of research being undertaken today, um, even just social science research. Um, where it's, you know, surveying or interviewing or, or things like that. So, um, but you put a lot of, of um, thought into your take on informed consent in this book. And I was wondering, maybe maybe talk about that just a little bit. Yeah, sure. And in fact, the question of informed consent, as you noted, is really at the forefront of a lot of bioethical thinking. And one of the issues that's raised with respect to donor compensation, which is, might not appear to have much relevance to informed consent, but does, is the question of what happens when you start offering donors compensation. And some critics of donors compensation say, well, if you do that, some people will start not to donate. And you might get a shortfall in plasma or blood or kidneys. Now, we know empirically that's just false. The United States, because it compensates its donors, is able to be the world's biggest supplier of plasma. There are patients all over the world who are alive because of the United States system. So the idea that you'll get less plasma if you compensate donors is just wrong. But what I found was really interesting is there is experimental evidence that shows that when you offer compensation, some people start not to donate. Mm. And that's really interesting because it seems weird. Right? If you think if you're saying, well, I'm donating plasma for nothing and somebody's now going to offer me, say, $30 for it, I'd think this is awesome. I'll donate more or I'll just keep donating. But some people stop. And so I wondered why that was. And it struck me that probably what's going on has to do with informed consent. Mm. So previously, when there's no compensation offered, 
donors think rightly that they're giving the priceless gift of life, which they absolutely are. But when compensation is offered, they might think, well, I'm giving the priceless gift of life, but in economic terms, it might only be worth $30 or so. That's how much I'm being offered for my donation. Now, if you're somebody who's got a fairly well-paying job, say you're a physician, you're a nurse, you're an attorney, and you want to do something altruistic and help others, you might think to yourself, giving plasma is wonderful, that really helps people, but maybe my time might be spent better elsewhere because I've got such a high paying job and such a specific skill set. So rather than donating plasma, I might say volunteer for an extra hour at a hospital for impoverished people or work pro bono as an attorney for an hour or so. So you might see people, once they realize the economic value of their donation, thinking my time might be best spent elsewhere. So I'm paid $100 an hour as an attorney. And so rather than use my time for a $30 donation, I'll use my time for a $100 donation in my legal services. Right. So it might be that the amount of compensation offered will help people decide where their time is best used. If that's so, then that's a piece of information people need to have to give their informed consent. So if so, you're really getting donor informed consent, you've got to compensate, or at least so offer compensation. Your, your argument is, is to boil it down um, overly simplistically, would be that it, it adds a new feature of transparency and clarity. Yes. In yeah, that's an excellent way of putting it. Yeah, it makes yeah. the whole process much more transparent. And right. it gives information to people that some people will need to know. Right. So the, the, the other part about this, well, there are many other parts about this, but the, the one thing that I wanted to, to get your thoughts on as well in this in this brief podcast um, is is a concept that's related to that. And it's it's related to, I guess, the um, the way in which people interact with each other in society, um, sort of growing up and around a certain code of norms of behavior that um, most people are, are following and familiar with and, and such. And one is, you know, goes back a very, very long way in sociology and philosophy, which is, you know, reciprocity and, and things of that nature. And, you know, I, I've often wondered, you know, the, the concern about the commercial world and its, its um, influence on uh, perhaps some, some non-commercial considerations whenever it comes to things like community engagement, social cohesion, relationships that are not purely commercial in nature. So how do you think about that in terms of, of your book? I think about that in terms of Girl Scout cookies. So Interesting. Girl Scouts raise money and they're Pretty, they're clear about it. They're raising money. They want the money. And they raise money by selling cookies. And the cookies, to be honest, they're not that great. But a lot of people buy Girl Scout cookies because they want to help the Girl Scouts out. And they want to do it in a way that isn't just, here's a handout. Right? There's reciprocity there. The Girl Scouts provide the cookies. They get experience in engaging with people and dealing with the public. And they raise money. So you might look at it on the one hand, this is just a commercial transaction, but I think that's really reductionistic. It really boils it down and misses stuff. And I think the same can be said about donor compensation as well. So, I mean, as you know, I visited a center and it was pretty clear that there was a community in that center. Yeah. Donors came in, they, in this particular center, they staff collected little rubber ducks, donors gave them rubber ducks, they brought rubber ducks on their vacation. It wasn't just a pure commercial transaction. So it might be that some of the donors initially started just to get compensation. But I think that's probably true in a lot of cases. But I think that the interactions with the donor staff, like any interactions, or the center staff, like any interactions, are very social. They're not purely commercial transactions. They get to know each other. And so the dichotomy between sort of raw commerce and somehow sort of no money social utopia. I think that's just empirically false and a really, really weird way to look at people. 
And, you know, for anybody listening, I bet everybody here has their favorite store that they go to and they know the people who work at that store. And if somebody leaves, St. James will say, oh, they've got a better job. Good for them. They say, oh, where have they gone? What's happened? Yeah, I, I've often I, I've wondered about this myself in, in a lot of ways where, as you put it, it's reductionistic just to ascribe one single motivation to a behavior, um, whether it's donating plasma, driving a car, you know, interacting with people in a certain way. Um, all of these things, they're 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 the human experience is is a little bit more complex than that perhaps a lot more complex than that. And um, I, I've, I've wondered if, if maybe the, the temptation there is always to ascribe a single cause for an, a single effect. And in fact, there are multiple causes to an effect or multiple effects either at the same time or on down the road. I think it's just one of those troubling um, you know, perhaps just a difficult thing to come to grips with um, in in today's society where we expect things to be quick, simple. Um, you know, why can't something happen just at the push of a single button? So. Yeah. And, and a lot of the actual studies and surveys of donors motivation that I looked at, most of the donors were saying, I'm doing it because I get to help people. This is wonderful. Yeah. And a lot of them actually say, I started off, I'd like to help people, but well, compensation was appealing. And then they said, look, what really drives me is I'm getting to hear stories of patients. I'm looking at the literature. I'm really doing something really, really special. And I like that. That gives me a really good feeling. Yeah, definitely. Um, I guess as we're, we're, we're coming up on our full time here, um, through, I mean, this this is a, a fairly, fairly slender volume. I don't know that you could read it in one sitting because you packed a lot of um, arguments and evidence and everything into what I would call an economically argued um, book. And I don't mean that it rests solely on economics, but in fact, you have an efficient use of, of your language and you use a lot of hypotheticals to, to kind of describe um, the situations that, that are being set up. Um, but coming away with this after, after you've published it, um, what is your, I guess, the, the most the, the most counterintuitive conclusion that you reached, the most surprising thing that, that you didn't expect to find? So the thing that I didn't expect to find was actually really surprising, but it turns out that sometimes donors do get exploited, but they don't get exploited by people who offer them compensation. They can some, they'll get exploited, or some donors will be exploited if they are, if they're living in a jurisdiction which doesn't allow compensation. And that's really weird because often people say poor donors are exploited when they're compensated. But it turns out they're exploited when they're not compensated. And I suppose a moment's thought will show why, right? If you say, if you think that somebody's getting exploited, the response to that shouldn't be, well, we'll compensate them less or not at all. The right. is we should compensate for more. So it turns out that if you live in a province, not to pick any particular country, which doesn't allow compensation and you're a donor but would like to be compensated, but because you are concerned about patients as you should be, you're a really good person and you still donate, you're actually getting exploited in that particular situation. Right. So, so that's it, it, really surprising. Well, you see, you see it all of a piece then, where where you're looking at things like, um, you know, starting with with donor suitability, donor health, making sure the person is well enough uh, to donate and and to donate safely, and that their plasma is going to be safe, all the way through informed consent and that transparency through the the idea that that somebody has has come away from the interaction. Um, well, both both parties have come away from, from the the interaction then better off than 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 what they had before. And I think that's an important point because it does shed a lot of light on the entire the entirety of of the the system uh, rather than just one. So interesting. All right. So thank you very much, James. Um, we appreciate your time, and um, we will we will be in touch again soon, I'm sure. And um, I'm looking forward to rereading your book. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you very much for having me on and talking with me about this. Great. Thanks, James.